This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. We are now several weeks into the U.S. COVID-19 outbreak, and I have to admit that I have some unanswered questions. Yes, questions. Questions are supposed to be a part of forming opinions, and while I have some opinions about reopening the country, they are still subject to change. I need more facts to refine my opinions. As of this morning, the confirmed case totals for the nation are over 1.2 million, with just over 72,000 fatalities. The resources I looked up showed something peculiar, though. Take a look at this map provided by Johns Hopkins. It shows 189,000 plus recovered patients, and it's slightly behind the actual numbers because they are tracking reports from individual cities, states, provinces, regions, and nations from all over the world. Now look at this one provided by MSN. Notice that while MSN shows more total cases and fatalities, it shows fewer recovered cases. Now presumably, the differences in reporting can be partially explained by the fact that MSN is tracking just the United States, except that it can't because they aren't. Take a look at New York's numbers. MSN, Johns Hopkins. The total number of cases is the same, but there are significant differences in the numbers of deaths reported and Johns Hopkins reports that over 58,000 New Yorkers have recovered from the illness, while MSN has no numbers for recovered patients. Yet, they have to be sourcing the same data because the total case numbers are exactly the same. What's going on here? For that matter, why are so many states in both tracking maps reporting no numbers for recovered patients? The CDC doesn't seem to be tracking the number of recovered cases at all, at least not that I can tell from their website. Strangely, the data on the CDC website seems to be a day behind as well. I did some checking, and each state is tracking and reporting their numbers differently. Every state and territory, including Washington, D.C., is tracking total infections and total deaths, both presumed and confirmed. Every state also seems to have some kind of statement to the effect of, we can only report the cases we know about because they admit that not everyone who has COVID-19 experiences symptoms or goes to the doctor to get diagnosed. Some states report hospitalizations, and some don't. Some states report recovered patients, and some don't. Some states provide plenty of data to back up their policy changes, and some don't. Michigan's state website for COVID seems to concentrate on reporting policy measures on top of the homepage and data hidden either far enough down the page that scrolling is necessary to find it, or placing it on its own page. And their data on recovered cases is at least five days old. Remember, this is Michigan, where armed protesters showed up to occupy the state house. Michigan, where the state legislature is locked in a fight with Governor Whitmer about the extent of her powers and her attempts to extend the state of emergency unilaterally. Now let's put some common sense to work here. If a state wants to ignore a problem and do nothing, then they normally hide the numbers to justify ignoring that problem. If a state wants to manage a problem, then the state normally broadcasts all of the numbers they can find to justify every step they take. The citizens of that state are more likely to accept broad, sweeping restrictions if the data supports those restrictions, which is why both of these things are true. When a state heavily restricts activities without providing enough data to support those restrictions, then the citizens of that state ask for those numbers. If they don't get them, then they will eventually demand those numbers. If those numbers still aren't forthcoming, then the citizens will demand that the restrictions be lifted. If ignored at that point, the protests will begin and escalate, typically in the form of rioting, but in the case of Michigan, in the form of armed citizens entering the state house to demand of their legislature information and action on the matter. This is actually our constitutional democratic republic working as it should. The voters collectively are the source of authority in our country, and voters need as much information as possible so that they can adequately assess the policies and actions of their elected officials. When elected representatives fail to exercise that power to their constituents' collective benefit, then the voters can and will demand that they do so. They can refuse to re-elect them to office. They can issue a recall petition. They can protest over the media or in person. They can challenge every action or lack of action in the courts. 
and if necessary, they can show up in person to demand the immediate resignation of any official. Governors, legislators, and other state officials should bear those things in mind. Now, the data that I need as a registered voter to accurately assess the responses to COVID includes at least a minimum the total tests given, total cases diagnosed, total hospitalized cases, total ICU cases, total deaths, and total recovered cases. I also need the daily new case data. That data needs to be plotted onto charts and graphs in a clear and concise manner so that I can plainly see if the rate of infection is growing, stable, or shrinking. That way, I can judge if the current measures are adequately addressing the problem. If the rate of growth is still increasing, then more measures are needed. If it is stable, then the measures are working. If it is decreasing, then the measures worked, and it's time to apply more common sense to start phasing out the temporary restrictions. But Rose, there will be a second surge when the restrictions are removed. Do you want people to die? I'm glad that you asked me that, because I know very well that a second surge of infections is possible, even likely, especially since we don't know exactly how many asymptomatic patients and mild cases will leave home at the same time that the rest of us do. And, no, I don't want anyone to die. But look, there is a well-established correlation between economic crisis and increased mortality. The longer that the economy remains in crisis, the more the rate of mortality increases. Past a certain point, the mortality from economic shutdown will exceed that of the virus. Even when comparing the mortality of the virus upon reopening and having a second surge, and the mortality due to the bad economy, there is a point where remaining in lockdown will kill more people than reopening the country and risking a second wave of infections. In short, we can't stay closed forever or even for a long period, without the economic collapse killing more people than the virus would, even if we removed all restrictions immediately. Moreover, no elected officials are suggesting that we lift all restrictions and send everyone back to work. If any of them did, we'd have as many people marching on the statehouse to reinstate the restrictions as we have now asking for them to be relaxed. But we can relax restrictions if the guidance from the federal government is being followed. Steadily, carefully, with plenty of common sense and good data, we can restore the economy and the consumer confidence in that economy. That's why I'm asking these questions. Why is the data incomplete? Why are government officials enacting policies without informing the public of justifications for those policies? How much longer can we continue to lock down huge portions of the country without losing more people than we save? At least I stand a better chance of getting answers to those questions than an answer to why so many people believe that their government is the reason that COVID happened in the first place.